question. It is impacting on children and it is impacting on the most vulnerable. So, no, I do not agree with the member. Many thanks. That concludes topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2, the marshal list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshal list of amendments, which I do, and I call, we start with Group 1, naturally, and I call Amendment 2 in the name of Ken McIntosh, Group with Amendments 3 and 5. Mr McIntosh, to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, when an individual in crisis applies to the Scottish Welfare Fund because they've run out of money, uh, as the bill stands before us, local authorities are not restricted in any way in how they decide to support that applicant. They can do so through an award of goods, vouchers or whatever type of in-kind payment they choose rather than in cash. The effect of the three amendments before us uh, this afternoon would not be to change or restrict that range of options. It would simply be to give ministers the authority to produce regulations about the circumstances in which councils could make non-cash awards. Now, President Officer, what, I'd, what I would then hope to see is that power used to ensure that local authorities treat all applicants with dignity and respect by taking their circumstances, their preferences and their views into account in deciding on the nature of the award. I have no doubt that in many circumstances, when applying for a community care grant, when looking to move into a new flat, for example, an individual may welcome a moving impact with all the plates, cutlery, bedding, furniture and everything else to make a home habitable, but they should have some say in that. When it comes to crisis grants, as opposed to community care grants, there is very strong evidence indeed that applicants would fare much better if given money rather than cards or vouchers. One of the strongest themes which emerged from the witnesses who gave evidence to the Welfare Reform Committee was that turning to the state for support in times of difficulty made them feel judged and stigmatised. We heard direct evidence that for people using vouchers or tokens in local shops, the experience could be embarrassing, making them feel small and undermining their sense of dignity. Is that really what we are trying to achieve? Are we trying to make people feel worse or to give them a hand up in their time of need? If anyone in this chamber received their salary in furniture or tokens, in all probability, they would feel offended or patronised. So why should we be surprised if applicants for welfare feel similarly? Surely our intention through our approach to welfare in the bill is to build up resilience by at the very least giving as much choice as possible in the hands of the recipient. Two years ago, presenting officer, a backbench Conservative tried to introduce a bill in the House of Commons which would see all benefit recipients paid using a card system through which the purchase of goods such as alcohol, cigarettes or sky television would be prohibited. He justified such an approach by talking about the idleness of the shirkers. Now, I suspect most liberally minded members here would be horrified at such a judgmental approach. And yet, how far away is that proposal from what happens day to day in Scotland? How easy would it be for some future administration to head in that direction? The anti-poverty organisations are clear that in-kind awards from the Interim Welfare Fund have already become the default position. Only half of all crisis grants and less than 20% of community grant awards are made by way of cash, cheque or direct bank transfer. In committee, some SNP members tried to defend this practice by suggesting it was more cost effective. But we heard evidence that such awards often did not produce best value for the recipient and indeed proved problematic and difficult as well as reducing independence. We heard, for example, that issuing vouchers instead of cash undermined a family's ability to get the best deals or the cheapest bargains by budgeting, spreading payments or shopping around for goods. 
we heard that items that are currently awarded do not always meet the identified needs of the applicant and their household. In fact, disabled applicants and other people who have very specific needs suggested they were far better placed than the local authority to identify and purchase items that met their own needs. For families in rural areas, the ability to find a shop that takes vouchers is likely to be limited, as well as stigmatising. Presenting officer, in health and social care, we are moving to self-directed support, specifically because we recognise that the personalisation agenda is very good for people's health and well-being. We have recognised that it is good for people's health to have more control over the carers that they employ. Why cannot we employ, apply exactly the same principle to welfare? The Scottish, Country for Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations put it very well, and I quote, for many, having cash to buy what they need is by far the best option, not least because it gives people some semblance of control and dignity at a time when they cannot control the factors which have led them into hardship. Now, to my mind, whatever our fine words about the principles of respect and dignity that we wish to see underpinning our approach to welfare in Scotland, the real test comes in the practice. I was reminded at the weekend of the motto of the Poverty Truth Commission, nothing about us without us is for us. The Commission knows that poverty will never be truly addressed until those who experience it firsthand are at the heart of the process. The SNP's approach to this subject can at best be described as paternalistic. This is the first in a number of new powers over welfare. Let's get the foundations right from the start. And I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I really enjoyed hearing Ken McIntosh speaking in support uh, of his proposals there, uh, because much of the argument that he chose to bring forward are exactly the same arguments as Conservatives are currently using for the universal credit and the fact that housing benefit, for example, should be paid directly to tenants rather than to their landlords in order to allow them to make choices about their priorities and what they do with their money. However, that inconsistency Consistency is one that I observe upon <clears throat> without influence on the broader argument. During the course of taking evidence on this matter, at which point I was mostly on the... Uh, yes, indeed. Ken McIntosh. Can I ask Ms Johnson, what choice do, uh, do recipients of housing benefit have when all of it has to go on rent? Alex Johnson. Let's carry on that argument another time. I'd be delighted to do so. But let's talk about the argument between cash and kind. During the course of evidence taking, during which time I was a member of the committee, it was obvious that Ken McIntosh had an agenda. And that agenda is one that I understand. He was keen to ensure that, wherever possible, cash rather than kind was the means by which support was given uh, to individuals who applied to local authorities for it. <clears throat> I take the view that uh, quite often, in certain circumstances, uh, giving benefits uh, or support in kind is the correct way to go. If you require a washing machine or a fridge and somebody can deliver one to you at short notice, then that is entirely a desirable approach to take. Similarly, if you live in a, a rural community, as Ken McIntosh himself uh, suggested was uh, one example, then you may well be unable to source uh, the relevant product uh, or device uh, locally at all. If you live in an island community, it's doubly as difficult. It's therefore essential, in my view, that local authorities are left with the discretion as to how they provide support. Because no two local authorities are the same, no two circumstances are the same. And as a consequence, many would, might prefer uh, to be supported in kind, while others may be, prefer to be supported in cash. But what can be delivered best locally is best left to the decision of the local authority. And it, for that reason, I believe it's essential that we do not constrain local authorities in their decision-making process, and we ensure that the best decisions are made locally for local people under local circumstances. I therefore oppose the amendments in this section. Thank you. I now call on Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, we have to remember that today uh, we are discussing a £38 million fund which is having to deal with uh, mitigating £6 billion worth of benefit cuts. Now, I believe that we should be treating 
everyone with dignity and respect. And that's why I put forward an amendment regarding that at stage two, um, which uh, was accepted. But I think we've also got to be realistic in terms of how far £38 million worth of funding can actually go. And I think we've also got to be realistic about how many people out there actually require help uh, because of that £6 billion worth of benefit cuts. And I, for one, uh, want to see that £38 million stretch out as far as it possibly can to help as many people who are facing these cuts as we possibly can. And I also believe uh, that we should not uh, be uh, constraining councils and that I would hope that common sense and compassion uh, would apply when it comes to uh, the payment uh, of money or the giving of goods to help individuals and families. And from my experience in terms of those folks uh, on the front line who are de dealing with the Scottish Welfare Fund, common sense and compassion has come into play. I would say, um, presiding officer, uh, that during the course of the evidence-taking sessions, we heard from many folks how happy they were to receive goods rather than cash. We heard from uh, folks who had left care, who uh, had received uh, furniture packages uh, from the local authorities uh, that they lived in, uh, and they were quite happy uh, with that situation. And I do think, again, that common sense needs to apply. In terms of, of, of the goods aspect, uh, in a briefing that we have from COSLA, they have said that there are actually benefits uh, in terms of the provision of goods that extend beyond uh, just uh, the individuals and families concerned themselves, but again uh, has led to probably more being able to be done with the within the constraints of the £38 million fund. They, they highlight the creation of over 140 full-time jobs as a direct result of the Scotland Excel framework uh, in this area. They highlight over 8,420 hours of work experience that's been afforded to individuals throughout Scotland because of that. Uh, they talk about donations of furniture and flooring that have come in free of charge, including free person hours to allow installers and carpet fitters to help charitable organisations assist vulnerable young adults to set up home. Uh, they talk about the opening of satellite stores to serve as councils, and that has provided sub substantial efficiency benefits, making deliveries from local premises leading to sig significant reduction in carbon footprint, resulting in savings of some 170 tonnes of CO2 emissions. Um, and they talk about recycling and reduction to landfill. Now, these are particularly good things. And Mr McIntosh has painted a picture that nobody wants goods. That is not what has come out in evidence. But the key, presiding officer, quite simply is the fact that I think that we have a duty to help as many folk as we can within the constraints of that £38 million fund, uh, which, of course, as I said earlier, is having to mitigate £6 billion worth of benefit cuts. And if Mr McIntosh was truly serious about resolving some of these problems, then his Labour colleagues would not have walked through the Tories, through the lobbies with the Tories the other week for £30 billion worth of more austerity cuts. Many thanks. Minister Margaret Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to be clear at the start that the guidance on the Scottish Welfare Fund states that local authorities must ensure items awarded meet the needs of applicants. For example, where people need specific items because of a medical condition or their family makeup, and that's, that, that's not a question of choice, that's of need. And I wish we didn't need a welfare fund and applicants didn't need the support they do. However, the Scottish Welfare Fund is the safety net for people in need, and in most cases, their last resort. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the, the Minister will be aware that in the quarterly report to 30th September, 
A million pounds was provided to applicants for food, a disgrace in our society. Is there not a degree of urgency when it comes to feeding the Wains and feeding families who are hungry uh, through the Welfare Fund and that we should do nothing to make the process any lengthier and in, because urgent action is needed in these circumstances? Minister. Yes, absolutely. I agree with the member. It is a fund for dealing with people in emergency and crisis situations. It's a budget-limited fund operating in a time of increasing need. And for this reason, it has to be able to help as many people as it can in the most efficient way possible. Local authorities have found, particularly with community care grants, that this means awarding goods rather than cash grants. And COSLA estimates local authorities save around 20% by using bulk buy versus cash payments. And that's not to say there is no choice. Local authorities do provide choice where they can. In the majority of local authority areas, applicants have a choices on a range of goods. They have also have a choice uh, in terms of fabrics and colour, curtains, towels. They get a choice in that. Examples of where customers with specific needs have received different items to ensure what is awarded meets the need include a family with, with three children being offered a 10 kilogram washing machine as opposed to a standard five kilogram washing machine. Large families can choose between bunk beds instead of single divans to allow more floor space for children to play. Disabled customers who request hard flooring to allow ease of use for wheelchairs would receive laminate flooring, not carpets, which could be unsuitable. And many applicants, as been said, uh, I think by Kevin Stewart, appreciate the service provided by local authorities. The delivery and installation of goods can relieve a lot of stress and anxiety that comes with having to arrange that for themselves, particularly at times of stress and vulnerability. Many simply cannot access shops to choose goods. Uh, to, to sum up, Presiding Officer, I would rather that local authorities were able to provide community care grants to 1,200 households by providing goods. Well, I'll, I'll take a quick Stevenson, briefly, uh, please. A technical intervention. I note that uh, this introduces uh, an affirmative procedure for new secondary legislation. Given that that implies a 40-day delay before uh, legislation can become effective, should the DPLR, the Delegated Powers Committee, not have had the opportunity to consider what form of secondary legislation should have applied in this example? Mr. I think uh, I don't know how helpful uh, the member's uh, technical amendment was, but certainly in all of our, we, we took on every recommendation from the, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, that they made in terms of regulations and the affirmative procedure and introduced that at, at stage two of the proceedings. Um, so back to, to where I were um, about we'd rather help a thousand people to choose how they're helped, leaving 200 people with no help at all. So I think it is about helping as many people as we can from the funds available. However, in respect of crisis grants, I consider cash or cash equivalent to be the most appropriate method of payment. And I've committed to ensuring in regulations that cash is the default position for crisis grant payments, unless it suits the applicant to have an award fulfilled in another manner. And I would therefore ask Ken McIntosh not to press Amendment 2. Many thanks. Uh, Ken McIntosh, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendment, Mr McIntosh. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, and a number of uh, comments made there. First of all, from Alex Johnson, who suggested that I have an agenda. And can I say, I do have an agenda. It's nothing to do with cash be kind. It's simply to empower individuals to make the most of their own abilities. It's to move away from a welfare system and a welfare reform programme that is both punitive and undermines people's sense of their own self-worth. And Alex Johnson went on to suggest that he was more concerned with constraining local authorities than helping individuals. Bizarrely, Kevin Stewart then suggested that he agreed that he, wanted to, he didn't want to constrain local authorities. This is not about local authorities. This is about... I will give way to Mr Stewart, yes. Kevin Stewart. I, I think you uh, fail to, to miss the point, because those folks who are on the front line 
actually have a real recognition of the difficulties that people are going through. And what I said is that we shouldn't constrain uh, these folks and that common sense should apply. Uh, and I think one of the key things that Mr McIntosh must answer in terms of his summing up is why it is uh, he... Uh, pontificates here uh, in certain regards, but his colleagues in Westminster go through the lobbies with the Tories to vote for more benefit cuts and more austerity in this country. It doesn't match up. Ken McIntosh. Absolutely. I, I'm not sure from Mr, uh, Mr Stewart's remarks whether I did fail or didn't fail to miss the point in his opening remarks there. Uh, just to clarify, Mr Stewart did suggest that he was concerned about the constraint this place on local authorities, not on individuals, but on local authorities. And he went on, in fact, to talk about that we have to be realistic. We have to stretch money as far as possible. There is no evidence, there is no evidence, and I would say this to Mr Stewart, there's no evidence to suggest that the proposal I am making is going to be any less cost effective or any more expensive or, or drawn public resources in any way than the current system. Mr Alice Johnson. Mr Johnson. As we heard in evidence, if I give you the money to buy a washing machine, you can buy a washing machine with that. If I am a local authority and VAT registered, I can give you a washing machine and claim 20% VAT back. How is that not more efficient? And McIntosh? Uh, first of all, I, I don't know if, if Mr Johnson buys his own washing machine or does his own shopping, but if, if you... Uh, well, I'm sorry, Mr Johnson. Would you, if I would suggest, suggest to you that you were to leave your spending decisions on your washing machine or any other purchase you want to make to the local authority, do you believe the local authority is better placed than you are? Sorry to use the personal term here. I would ask Mr Johnson, does he believe that the local authority is better placed than he is to make purchases on his behalf? Because I don't believe there's one person in this chamber who actually thinks that they would trust a council or any other body, no matter how much we admire that council, to purchase goods on their behalf. So why do we apply that double standard to local authority and benefit recipients? There is no logic behind it. It is not cost effective. It will not draw extra on the public purse. And this idea that somehow the, men the amendment would help that by refusing the amendment, we help 1,000 rather than 200. There is no evidence to suggest this whatsoever. This is a paternalistic, a producer-led mentality, and it is by, by, it is by, by reason of criteria intervention, presiding officer, or not? Yes, but briefly, please, because we are needing Minister. to make to progress. Say, I didn't say help 1,000 less than 200. I said we could help another 200 people more um, by... Um, councils buy bulk, bulk, buying bulk goods. So instead of helping 1,200 people, um, they would help 1,000 if we didn't buy the bulk goods. 200 people more can be helped, and I think that's important. The fund has to stretch out. McIntosh, please can I suggest come the to Minister has presented no evidence to back that up, and can I give the example I did in committee? Can I give the evidence I gave in committee uh, just a few weeks ago in which instant neighbour in Aberdeen, in Kevin Stewart's own neighbourhood, Instant Neighbour pointed out that bulk purchasing of cheap, shoddily, shoddily produced goods is not necessarily the sustainable solution that people wish. I think we've heard quite enough. The presiding officer seems to agree with me that we've heard quite enough from Mr Stewart on this point. If he wants to side You're with the Tories... You're winding up, Mr McIntosh, if now, Mr please. Stewart wants to side with the Tories yet again, as, as the SNP so often do to get their, their, their amendments or to defeat amendments, then that's his choice. This attitude that the government, uh, I have no doubt, I mean, just to, to strike a slightly different note to conclude, I have no doubt that the Minister wishes to do the best by welfare recipients. I have no doubt what her intentions are. But could I ask her that if we do not actually allow ourselves to put the individual, the benefit claimant, at the heart of our thinking, then we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the current welfare system. And I would, I would take encouragement from her very last remarks that actually she will in, in, in try and encourage local authorities to deliver cash and not uh, in-kind payments. But I would urge members to put this in legislation and I would move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And so the question is that amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division and as this is the first division of the stage, I will suspend for five minutes.
Okay. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 2. This will be a 30-second division, and members should cast their votes now, please. The result of the vote on amendment number two is yes, 37, no, 80. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment three in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with, Ken, with amendment two. Ken McIntosh, to move or not? Are you moved. Thank you. So the question is that amendment three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number three is yes, 38, no, 80. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. And before we move to group two under rule 9.8.5a, I am minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the time limit be extended by 10 minutes. Minister. Thank you very much. So the question is that the time limit for debate be on amendments be extended by 10 minutes. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So we'll now move to group two. And I call amendment four in the name of Ken McIntosh and a group on its own. Mr McIntosh to move and speak to amendment four, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The effect of accepting amendment four would be to add families facing exceptional pressure to the legislative list of those who qualify for a community care grant. Just to cl clarify what that means, the Child Poverty Action Group suggests that the kind of families and situations we are talking about here include lone parents with young children who need household items following the violent breakdown of a relationship. Or, in another example, families in which the sudden deterioration in the condition of a disabled child justifies an award for a washing machine. For those who didn't follow our discussion on this amendment at stage two, the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund currently lists five types of qualifying criteria. Four of those categories are explicitly described on the face of the bill before us today, and the only group that is omitted, the only group not mentioned at all in the bill, are families facing exceptional pressure. In other words, under the legislation as drafted, someone facing the possibility of prison would qualify for support, but someone looking after the disabled husband or child would not. Someone at risk of becoming homeless would qualify, but someone fleeing domestic violence would not. At stage two, the minister presented two arguments. She seemed to suggest that as an alternative to accepting our amendment, she could include families facing exceptional pressure in guidance, but not on the face of the bill. I would ask her what authority she draws on to be able to name this group in regulations, but not in statute. If the Minister believes that the Section 30 order passed two years ago does not give her the power to name families facing exceptional pressure as a qualifying category in this Bill, then she has no power to direct or guide local authorities through regulations either. Conversely, if the Minister believes she can use guidance to help this particular group of people, then she should do so clearly in legislation, giving families equal status and equal priority with other vulnerable groups. The Minister presented a second argument at committee stage. 
She suggested that what data there was indicated that the interim scheme was currently successfully targeting families facing exceptional pressure. The trouble with that argument is that the interim scheme specifically includes this category on an equal footing with the other four categories qualifying for assistance. We don't have an issue with the interim scheme. It is only this bill before us today which demotes vulnerable families and clearly indicates to those who will have to interpret the law that they are not on a par with others needing assistance. In fact, we are in the bizarre situation where under the old DWP social fund system, the needs of vulnerable families were recognised. Under the interim system, their needs continue to be recognised, but under the new legislation, as drafted before us today, they are omitted. Whatever the Minister's intentions, as the SCVO have clearly stated, such a, and I quote, such a situation would give rise to a risk that local authorities or future governments might deprioritise applications from such families in order to protect their budgets or increase the share of community care grants available to other categories of applicants. Now, perhaps I could ask the Minister to clarify one other point in her reply. At committee, she highlighted her concerns over the competence of this amendment. One of the committee members then suggested the whole bill could fall if we were therefore to indicate our support. Can I ask the Minister to clarify that is not the case and it does not do our discussion any favours to hyperbolise the potential impact of one disputed clause. Presenting officer, the Poverty Alliance have highlighted that the minimum cost of raising a child in 2013 rose by 4%, while the minimum wage rose by less than 2%, and for those needing support, benefits were capped at 1%. Quite simply, Families are under ever-increasing pressure. They have little or nothing in the way of savings to call on, and they are relying on us. They need to know that they can turn to the Scottish Welfare Fund for support in a crisis or in an emergency. This amendment has the support of the SEVO, Poverty Alliance, Inclusion Scotland, CPAG, One Parent Family Scotland and Carer Scotland. I urge the Chamber to support it, and I move Amendment 4 in my name. Many thanks. And given the constraints in time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to limit uh, speakers to one minute in this debate. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. And uh, something that really frustrates me is when uh, this Parliament is not given the uh, competence to do something. Obviously, I think the Parliament should have the competence over everything uh, that uh, affects the people of Scotland. Uh, what we have clearly uh, been told is that this amendment would uh, take Section 2 uh, beyond the legislative competence of Parliament uh, and could risk the bill receiving uh, royal assent. Now, what I want to see is prote protection for families who are facing exceptional pressure. And I hope to he uh, hear from the Minister how we're able to do that. But what I do not want to do is I do not want to risk this bill becoming law. Uh, Mr McIntosh men mentions things like the minimum, wa minimum wage, which we don't control. He mentioned the benefit cap affecting families. It is rather strange that his party voted for that benefit cap in Westminster. And what we're hearing here today from the Labour benches is hypocrisy, hypocrisy, hypocrisy. Thank you. And now call on Tavish Scott. Order, please. Thank, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if I could just raise two uh, questions for the Minister in line with uh, Ken McIntosh's remarks. The first is the uh, legal question of guidance versus the uh, placing something in statute. It seems to me a fundamental point there if, uh, in terms of the consistency of the bill. I'm sure she'd want to clarify that for Parliament in terms of, uh, or in terms of the approach that she wants to take on all of the clauses that uh, Parliament's debating this afternoon. And secondly, uh, as uh, uh, Ken McIntosh also mentioned, the Child Poverty Action Group and indeed many other groups have looked for for uh, clarity around the government's position on why this uh, could be considered, could be considered by some lawyers to be outside uh, the powers of this uh, bill. If that's the case, and if it's the case, is this not a case where, under the Smith Agreement, the very sensible constructive arrangements to, that are being put in place to ensure governments can resolve these kind of issues shouldn't be brought to bear? Many thanks. And finally, Alex Johnson. We talk a lot about welfare issues in this Parliament, but today when we talk about the, uh, the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, we're talking about the safety net that lies below the safety net. We're talking about the last line of defence. It's therefore essential that no one should be allowed to fall through it. 
And Ken McIntosh has clearly identified a group which he believes were covered by previous provisions, were covered by the interim Scottish Welfare Fund, but yet are not covered by the proposals that we take today. Kevin Stewart's concerned that the Queen might be somehow offended by this and not grant royal assent. What I would say is that by stage three of this process, we should have had more clarity from the Scottish Government about exactly what it is they mean uh, and not still uh, dithering about whether it may or may not be competent. I therefore think unless the Minister can come up with a very good answer that it would be sensible for this Parliament to proceed today by supporting this amendment. Minister. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. The intention behind this amendment has been the subject of much discussion throughout the passage of the Bill, and I know that many stakeholders and MSPs in the Chamber would like to add families under exceptional pressure as an explicit group in the Bill. While I may have liked to have been able to include a specific reference to families under exceptional pressure on the face of the Bill, as, as Kevin Stewart alluded, as with many decisions about welfare, it is not within the gift of the Scottish Parliament without having regard to the limits of competence. The, bill, um, the qualifying people in the Bill are mirrored what is on the Section 30 order, and that is what we, we have got to stay within that to, to keep the competence of this Bill. To have accepted the amendment would have taken the Bill out of the competence of the Scottish Parliament. And I think the risk of the Bill not gaining royal assent, and it is not about the Queen, it is about the risk of this Bill not gaining royal assent, is just too great. It would have resulted in the funds having no statutory basis and applicants having no right to an independent review by the Ombudsman. And that is not to say that we will not try to amend the terms of this legislation in future. The Smith Commission agreed that this Parliament should have new powers to make discretionary payments in any area of welfare. Clause 18 of the draft clauses published by the UK Government goes some way towards delivering that. We do not think, however, that it goes far enough, and I have asked my officials to start discussions with the Scotland Office about widening its scope appropriately so that this Parliament can then revisit the terms of the Act flowing from this Bill in light of the required widened competence. In the meantime, my officials are already working with CPAG to make sure that families under exceptional pressure get due regard in the Welfare Fund's guidance. And as I said at Stage 2, I intend to make explicit reference to families under pressure in the regulations that will follow the Bill, and that is a subsection of the wider uh, group covered. And having said all of that, I would like to take this opportunity to put beyond doubt the capacity of welfare funds to support low-income families facing exceptional pressures. And as I said at stage two, there is no barrier now, nor under the permanent arrangements by virtue of the Bill's wording, to prevent families under exceptional pressure from accessing welfare funds. Regulations and guidance will ensure that applications from that group continue to be given priority. And this means that families under exceptional pressure will continue to be able to access welfare funds in the same way as they do now. And indeed, the Scottish Welfare Fund statistics show that under the interim scheme, 38 per cent of households receiving community care grants contain children, in comparison to 32 per cent under the Social Fund. The Scottish Welfare Fund figures for crisis grants is 30 per cent compared to 16 per cent of social fund crisis loans. So for the reasons I have outlined above, I ask Ken McIntosh not to press this amendment. Thank you. Mr McIntosh. A point of order, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the questions over competence, it would be helpful to members who have not been part of the committee scrutiny of this bill if you could indicate whether the amendment's presence on the marshal list indicates that it has been ruled by the presiding officer as competent. As members will be aware whether or not the subject matter of an amendment is within the legislative competence of the Parliament is not one of the criteria which will determine an amendment's admissibility. hope that is helpful. Where were we? I now call on Ken McIntosh to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment as briefly as possible, please, Mr McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, those comments were slightly helpful. Perhaps it would be more helpful to Mr Harvey to know that the amendment was drawn up by the Parliament's own lawyers. And, and so its competence is in no doubt. And if I may point out, Mr. I don't know if Mr Harvey has... 
I don't know if Mr Harvey's ever served on the, what used to be known as the sub-legislative committee, but the number, of, the number of acts that go through this Parliament which are challenged by the Scottish Parliament's lawyers as being uh, incompetent and ultra vires every single week, every single week, and the government blithely ignore these ultra vires claims every week and say that they will not be challenged. And they, they present this particular argument. They say they will not be challenged. Well, I say to the Minister, who is going to challenge Bruce, this? Uh, Mr who Mac is going to challenge Point of this order, particular... Bruce Crawford. Please confirm to me that, that we're dealing with two completely different matters here. There's a complete, an absolute difference between something that's competently put down in an amendment and something that's competent with under the Scotland Act. Would you confirm that these two things are completely different Absolutely. and that Ken McIntosh is talking a lot of nonsense? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. He is. Yeah. Thank you. As you will be aware, the competence in this set of circumstances is a matter of debate and the presiding officer has made her ruling on it. Mr McIntosh, please resume. Thank you, presiding officer. I would suggest, and I would ask the minister yet again, who exactly is going to challenge the competency or otherwise of this particular order? We are trying to include... We are trying to include families under exceptional pressure in the face of the bill. Does the minister believe... Does the minister believe that families will challenge this? Does the Minister believe that benefit claimants will challenge this? Does the Minister believe that Mr, K Mr. Stewart's Farfetch... have order, that please, to allow Mr this? McIntosh to make his points. Yes, I will take his on to what Mr McIntosh is saying there, asking our families going to challenge. Of course I don't think that, but what we are saying is that this is out with the competence of what we are able to do just now, and I don't want to put the bill under threat because of that, and families under exceptional pressure are not excluded from help throughout the Permanent Welfare Fund bill that we are putting through today. Ken McIntosh, you have to come to your conclusion very quickly now, please. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, a point of order. Would, would the presiding officer please confirm that it's actually the Advocate General who would decide yeah. upon whether a matter is con it contravenes the Scotland Act or not, and the, and the power and responsibility lies in that office, and it's highly likely that if a, if a body of legislation that was passed here did not meet th his particular rules, then he would rule against yeah. that Act? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, once a bill has been passed... There are various processes in place as set out in the Scotland Act 1998 that may be initiated if someone views a bill or any of its provision as being out with the Parliament's legislative competence. Officer, somebody, who might use the bill, somebody who might use the bill might offer a challenge. Well, Mr Crawford, I put it to you exactly who. Perhaps Mr Crawford would get on his feet again and tell me who is going to challenge the competence. Mr. Mr Crawford seems to suggest that his government's own Advocate General is going to challenge the competence of a measure presented by this Parliament to help families under exceptional pressure. Oh, I'll take Mr Salmond. I'll take Mr. Sam I'll take Mr Salmond if that's all right. Mr Salmond. I would have thought that a parliamentarian of Ken McIntosh's long experience would know that an Advocate General is a post of the Westminster <laughs> Government. Not a point of order, but thank you. But Mr McIntosh, you must close within the next 20 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Can I just say I was quite pleased to hear Mr Salmon make a contribution to this debate, given that he supports the welfare cap that Mr Stewart talked about just a few minutes earlier. But I was delighted to see him come in. Thank you. Order. Oh, oh. Order. Plus, Are you pressing or I, withdrawing I your see, amendment, Mr McIntosh? I see the back bench has seemed very comfortable to sit on for Mr Salmon when challenged. Can I just suggest to the Minister, can I suggest to the Minister that she did not answer Press any withdraw of my your questions. amendment, Mr McIntosh. Very well, Presiding Officer. I press this amendment. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a one-minute division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 4 is yes, 54, no, 62. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 5 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with Amendment 2. Mr McIntosh, to move or not move? Moved. The amendment is moved. There will therefore be a div um, The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 5 is yes, 37, no, 80. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. And as we have passed the agreed time limit under Rule 9.8.4e, brackets A, I consider it necessary to allow the debate on Group 3 to continue beyond the limit in order to allow those with the right to speak on amendments in the group to do so. That, in this case, that will only be the Minister and Mr McIntosh. We now move to Group 3, and I call on Ken McIntosh to speak to Amendment 6 and carry on from there. Thank you, President Officer, and I hope this amendment is slightly less contentious uh, or provokes slightly less reaction than the other two seem to have. The effect of Amendment... Uh, maybe I'm optimistic, Mr Johnson. The effect of Amendment 6 would be to ensure that decisions on applications for crisis grants should be made immediately where possible, and if not immediately, by the end of the next working day in any event. As some members will know from evidence to the Welfare Reform Committee, under the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, local authorities have 48 hours in which to process a claim. However, under the previous DWP scheme, the deadline was 24 hours. Now, the issue first came to light when figures were presented to the committee that revealed that the interim fund was not meeting applicants' needs as timiously as the previous scheme. For example, the figures for the old DWP crisis loan system show that the payments made in two days uh, were made in 98.5% of cases, compared with just 94% for the Scottish Welfare Fund. The point was picked up by a number of voluntary and anti-poverty organisations. Uh, couriers, for example, highlighted their concern that if a 48-hour deadline were to be applied, an application that is made on Thursday or Friday might not be processed until late on Monday after the weekend. The strongest evidence probably came from Child Poverty Action, however, who said, and I quote, in the experience of our advisers, applications for crisis loans made over the phone were processed very quickly by the DWP. Delay was sometimes caused by difficulties getting through on the phone in the first place, but once connected, the process was generally very quick. Decisions were often made at the end of the initial phone call, with the claimant given an office from which an award could be collected on the same day. And they went on, this also happens with some, though not all, Scottish Welfare Fund crisis grant applications. CPAD concluded that there is no implicit reason that processing times should be longer in relation to crisis grants, that is under the new system, than they were for crisis loans. They are also concerned that the reference to a 48-hour time limit, once all relevant information is received, may lead some decision makers to request evidence when it is not needed. In other words, although this is clearly not the Minister's intention, the 48-hour backstop will become a target which will in inadvertently have the effect of slowing down the process rather than speeding it up. Now, in her remarks to the Welfare Reform Committee, the Minister suggested that uh, she was going to consult actively in this area. She intended to think carefully about the issue uh, before including it in regulations. Can I ask the Minister if she has had time to, to think about this matter further and whether she can share any of those thoughts with the Chamber? If not, I would urge members to support Amendment 6 in my name, which would replace the current 48-hour backstop with the original 24-hour timescale. Thank you, Minister. And I move Amendment to my name. Okay, uh, thank you, 
presiding officer, we have been clear from the start of the interim fund that speed of processing is key because of the risk of harm to applicants. The guidance in the interim fund requires local authorities to process crisis grants as soon as possible, and it requires that urgent applications for living expenses be prioritised. The maximum processing time of two working days is to make it clear that long processing times are not acceptable, and it is in no way a target or a waiting time. We also know that under the interim fund, 64 per cent of crisis grants are processed on the same working day and a further 24 per cent are processed, processed the next day. And only yesterday, in a visit to a Scottish Welfare Fund team, I spoke to the staff who demonstrated their dedication and commitment in dealing with all the crisis grant applications to process them within the day, especially on Fridays, so that applicants are not left in crisis for extended periods. And as Ken McIntosh said, I indicated at stage two that I would be consulting on 24-hour processing times for crisis grants in regulations. But I have considered this further and looked at the amendment again. And the amendment supports the approach we have taken in our current guidance, and it also fits with performance of local authorities in actually processing crisis grants. And given the level of support of this amendment from stakeholders and from across the chamber, I am happy to accept this, this amendment. Mr. McIntosh, to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please. I was not optimistic. Thank you very much, Minister. I press the amendment. Uh, so the question is that amendment six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. We now move to Group 4, and I call Amendment 7 in the name of Margaret McDougall in a group on its own. Margaret McDougall, to move and speak to Amendment 7, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment seeks to amend Kevin Stewart's amendment passed at Stage 2 in respect for and dignity of applicants for assistance, and adds that the particular needs and choices of applicants are to be considered by the local authority. This amendment ensures that local authorities can make awards in cash rather than in kind so that recipients can have some responsibility of choice and control in their lives. At stage two, it was argued that introducing choice would put pressure on local authorities' budgets. However, I would argue that treating people with dignity and respect is about allowing them to exercise their right of choice. And this amendment ensures that a payment can either be made in kind or monetary value. There is no reason a crisis grant would cost the local authority any more because the award is in money value rather than in kind. It would be cost neutral. The amendment is also supported by the Poverty Alliance, who stated that the refusal to trust applicants with monetary grants increases stigma and can make the applicant feel like they are receiving handouts rather than accessing legitimate support from the state's social security system. We believe it is important that all decisions are made around what is best for the individual and the applicant's voice should be heard through the decision-making process. In evidence, the Welfare Committee heard of many incidents where lack of choice resulted in increased stigma for the individual living in poverty. SCVO argued that the argument against choice focused primarily on administrative convenience. And this bill will be the benchmark for any future benefits legislation in the Scottish Parliament. So it should be an exemplar for welfare legislation in Scotland. And as such, it needs to show it has the needs and choice of the individual at the centre of that legislation. Being allowed choice is how you are and how you are supported must drive the fund and this supporting legislation. I hope that the Scottish Government sees fit to support the amendment at stage three to remove the stigma and support that applicants' right to choice. I would argue that cost is not an issue as this amendment to include choice is cost neutral. I move the amendment in my name. Hey, thanks. Minister. Oh, Alex Johnson, a late press. Um, I'm seeking clarification uh, from the mover of this amendment. If the purpose 
of this amendment is merely to ensure that flexibility exists within the system, then I can understand uh, why we would wish to pursue that. But is it the intention through this amendment to bring in the guaranteed right of an applicant to have payment from a local authority in cash if they make that choice? Is that the intention of the amendment, or am I misreading it? Ken McIntosh, briefly, please. Uh, I would just echo the point that this bill, this is about getting the principles right behind this bill. This is the first of a series of bills implementing a new welfare system in Scotland. And it's very important that we get the principles right. The Minister accepted an amendment at stage two from Kevin Stewart on dignity and respect. But she left out uh, the needs and uh, choices of the individual. And yet this is very much in keeping with Scottish Government policy. The Self-Directed Support Act talks about individuals being able to make an informed choice. The Public Bodies Joint Working Act, through integration principles, encourages integrated health and social care services to take account, quote, of the particular needs and circumstances of individuals. The NHS Quality Strategy mentions improved patient choice. Can I just ask the Minister, what is wrong with having the word choice as a principle in this bill? Minister. It's always been a priority that welfare funds should be delivered in such a way that the dignity of welfare fund users is preserved. And that's why I was happy to accept the welfare reform at the Welfare Reform Committee to accept the amendment put forward by, by Kevin Stewart. And that amendment at stage two accorded with my view that regardless of the funds available, welfare services should be delivered with respect and dignity. And this is now clearly established in the bill. The issues that are relevant to this amendment have already been covered during the debate on the Group 1 amendments that were brought forward by Ken McIntosh. And as I said while we were debating these amendments, it's simply not the case that allowing increased choice for applicants would not lead to increased costs for local authorities. Local authorities would have higher administrative costs uh, involved with it was discussing choices with applicants, potential queries, change of mind, and even getting uh, the cash in some instances for, com and I'm talking here about community care grants, to get the cash out at the levels that are required. There's additional in administrative charges in that. But the Scottish Welfare Fund is a budget limited fund operating in a time of increasing need, and it needs to be able to help as many people as it can in the most efficient way possible. And as I said earlier, local authorities have found that in community care grants in particular, that they can make, help more people uh, awarding goods rather than cash grants. And I've already made clear in the earlier debate that when it comes to crisis grants that we'll introduce in regulation, that the default position for crisis grants should be cash. But COSLA estimates, as, as I said, broadly, local authorities save about 20% by using bulk buy versus cash payments. And we can't discount that. And it can't be done unless local authorities can guarantee certain volumes. And it was also very clear that where specific items are required, local authorities should be providing these. And this is in the current guidance and will be in the statutory guidance that, that we issue under the bill. And I don't want to go over all that ground again now, but I'm happy to restate... I'll be grateful if you come to a close, please, indeed. Okay, I'm happy to restate that we'll look again at the guidance for the permanent arrangements to see if there's more we can do to ensure that where applicants have a genuine need for a particular product, there's a clear understanding that, that, that this should happen. And I was happy to support Kevin Stewart's amendment at stage two, which I do believe captured the essence of what stakeholders have been calling for without bringing additional pressure to bear in local authority budgets. Amendment seven does not achieve this aim, so I urge Margaret McDougall to withdraw it. Thank you. Margaret McDougall, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendment, please. Thank you. Um, in answer to Alec Johnson's question on whether if an individual chooses a monetary crisis loan, uh, the local authority must provide it. I think that was the, the gist of what you were asking. The amendment allows for choice to best suit the needs of that individual in discussion with the local authority. There will be circumstances when the individual's choice will be overruled by the local authority. For example, if that particular individual perhaps has a, a history of... Um, losing their purse, which is quite often uh, why a crisis loan is uh, given, or, uh, you know, there is a, a health issue uh, with that particular individual. So um, choice at least would be discussed. And I, uh, there has been wide support 
for this amendment with the third sector. And there is no reason a crisis grant, as I said before, would cost the local authority any more because the award is in monetary value rather than in kind, and it would be cost neutral. So there would be no additional cost to the local authority. I'm going to have to rush you, I'm afraid. I have heard nothing in the arguments that make me want to reconsider my amendment, so I push the amendment in my name. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. This will be a one-minute division. The result of the vote in amendment number 7 is yes, 37, no, 79. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group 5. We are now extraordinarily tight for time for the afternoon. I call amendment 8 in the name of Margaret MacDougall in a group on its own. Margaret MacDougall to move and speak to amendment 8 briefly, please. Thank you. This amendment relates to annual reporting and it requests that the Scottish Government should prepare an initial report giving information about the delivery of welfare funds. The initial report should be laid before Parliament on or before 30th of June 2016, with subsequent reports being laid before Parliament on or before the same date annually. The initial report should include information on the following, the amount paid out to the welfare fund, the number of applications for assistance in pursuance of Section 2 that have been received, and the number of applications where financial assistance was provided and where assistance was provided in kind and the number of applications rejected. This information is the bare minimum that the report must include and the Scottish Government can include additional information if it considers it appropriate. Given this is the first real piece of welfare legislation created by the Scottish Parliament, it is correct we set procedure for proper review. Parliament should be able to scrutinise how the Welfare Fund is performing and its effectiveness and mm -hmm. annual reporting would allow this. This amendment is in line with the Scottish Parliament principles as it promotes openness and transparency and it is a matter of good practice to make sure that these statistics are kept on record and reported to the Parliament annually. The amendment also is being called for by the SCVO who state that given the critical nature of the fund and the concerns outlined above, both government and parliamentary view, review is vital. We support proposed amendments for review submitted by Scottish Labour. At the very least, we seek a strong assurance from ministers that the fund will be comprehensively reviewed and can be scrutinised by the parliament under the provisions of the Welfare Reform Further Provisions Scotland Act 2012. Again, this amendment was voted down at stage two, but I hope the Scottish Government will reconsider, more so given the recent announcements, announcements regarding reporting on NHS statistics. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnston. Less than one minute, please. Uh, very briefly, Deputy Presiding Officer, the information requested in this uh, amendment is information that should be easily available to the government. It is not onerous to record, and the publication deadline uh, and timetable which is set out, uh, I think, gives them plenty of time to achieve that. It would foster uh, and underpin discussion uh, and policy development on this scheme by both government and other parties, and I think it would be valuable if that information were published annually according to the amendment.
Tavish Scott, as briefly as possible, please. Uh, presenting officer, I would like to support Margaret McDoodle's amendment for two reasons. The first is that the uh, Smith Agreement will uh, create more opportunity in this area for new developments that this Parliament will wish to take forward, and therefore it will be in the interest of the Government to introduce a new form of transparency to their policy making and indeed to government scrutiny, Parliament's scrutiny of that. And the second thing is if we do not do it now, Audit Scotland will recommend this in three years' time and will end up having to do it. Thanks. Ken McIntosh, briefly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Yes, this is, we're putting a new system in place for welfare, and I believe we should have the information to be able to scrutinise and uh, hold that system to account, and particularly that Parliament should have a formal role to play in that. There, there, I would just remind the Minister, despite the heated debate of our heated interchange so far, this has been a generally consensual broad agreement about this bill, but there are concerns, for example, about the underspend of resources in certain areas, about gatekeeping by some local authorities, and about whether or not information about protected characteristics has been gathered. So I would urge Minister to accept the idea of a process of review and to give Parliament a role in that. I Thank you. Minister. Minister. Okay. Uh, as has been said, uh, presiding officer, at stage two, I said that I agreed with the, view, the views of the Welfare Reform Committee stage one report, which recommended that an ongoing monitoring was preferable to a review clause. My view in this issue remains the same. Our statistical monitoring framework, framework already captures the information that the amendment suggests we lay in a report before the Scottish Parliament. The statistical monitoring, which we currently publish on a quarterly basis, provides an excellent mechanism for highlighting any issues that arise, such as those outlined by Ken McIntosh uh, in the operation of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Many of the discussions that the Welfare Reform Committee have had since the Welfare Fund has launched have come directly from analysis of the statistical reports. Alongside the case observation work we have been carrying out with COSLA, the statistical publications have allowed for both local authorities and the Scottish Government to respond to issues as they arise. At stage two, I also highlighted the role of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman and independent reviews of disputed local authority decisions that he will undertake. These independent reviews will also provide a mechanism for scrutiny of the operation of individual, individual local authorities and any patterns in complaints and reviews that indicate unintended consequences of regulations and guidance. I also fully expect that the workings of the permanent arrangements will be subject to an ongoing parliamentary scrutiny through the committee process and future consideration of Scottish Government budgets. It would be very surprising if the permanent arrangements were not to be subject to scrutiny as the Scottish Parliament considers Scottish Government plans for implementing the new welfare-related powers that will flow from the Smith Commission process. In summary, I believe that sufficient mechanisms exist through the Parliament, Scottish Government statistical publications and from the input we all have from the third sector in Scotland to mean that an ongoing requirement to lay an annual review in Parliament is not going to add significantly to the knowledge we have on how welfare funds are operating. In fact, it could even divert scarce resources from the established continuous improvement work that is taking place. On this basis, I ask Margaret McDougall to withdraw her amendment. Margaret McDougall, I am afraid I am going to have to ask you just to press or withdraw your amendment, please. Oh, can I just... Can I just thank Alec Johnson and Tavish Scott for their support? So I hope that the Minister would have supported a specific report given the importance of the Welfare Fund and of this bill. I push the amendment in my name. Press. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division, and this will be a one minute division. Please vote now.
result of the vote in amendment number 8 is yes, 50, no 66. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group 6. I call amendment 1 in the name of the minister and a group on its own minister to speak to and move amendment 1. Okay. So uh, this is a technical amendment which removes a provision which would have related to a section of the bill that was proposed at a, as a stage two amendment. The stage two amendment in question was withdrawn, so there is no requirement for the provision at section 6G5 2CD that this amendment removes. I move amendment number one. Excellent. So the question, uh, Ken McIntosh. It was just to indicate our support. The Minister uh, was good in recognising the disproportionate nature of the powers granted to the Ombudsman, and this uh, amendment uh, arises as a consequence, and I would welcome it on behalf of the Labour Party. Mr. Wind up, please. Press your amendment. Move the amendment. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that ends consideration of amendments. So we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12485 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Minister Margaret Burgess to speak to and move the motion. Minister, you have 10 minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open this Stage 3 debate on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. And I would like to thank again um, Michael Ma McMahon and all the members past and present of the Welfare Reform Committee for their scrutiny of the bill and of the interim, interim arrangements that are currently in place. This bill is important in a number of ways. It is the first substantive welfare bill to come before the Scottish Parliament and it will provide a permanent, reliable safety net for people on low incomes. The bill sets out the high-level framework for welfare funds and it lays down some important boundaries which they will operate within. For example, the bill expressly rules, rules out using welfare funds to provide loans to applicants. It also requires local authorities to ensure that welfare fund customers are treated with respect and that their dignity is preserved. And this is an important marker for how this government wants to take forward the new welfare related powers that are coming to this parliament. The detail of how welfare funds will operate, which we, which we intend to be similar to the existing interim Scottish welfare fund, will be set out in regulations and guidance, which we will consult on in the summer. By bringing forward the bill, we have demonstrated a long-term commitment to the Scottish Welfare Fund and allowed the option of having an independent review of cases by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. The funding for the welfare funds can also be ring-fenced if required. And this approach is in direct contrast to the position in England where there is no equivalent, system, there is no equivalent systematic local welfare scheme in operation. And I'm proud to be part of a government which is taking a distinctive approach to protect vulnerable people in Scotland. And at stage one, the Welfare Reform Committee took evidence from a wide range of organisations and individuals. And it's testament to the successful partnership approach that we have adopted with COSLA and to the hard work put in by local authorities in developing the service over its short life that the majority of the evidence the committee heard at stage one was positive. And I'd also like to put in record my thanks to all those working in the, the Scottish welfare teams across the country. I have visited a number of these teams and just see how hard that those working there are putting committed to the service that they are providing to the local community. There have of course been some amendments to the bill and the largest number of amendments at stage two were planned in advance due to the timing of our discussions with the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. They relate to the detail of his role in undertaking independent reviews of local authority decisions on welfare fund applications. This independent second tier review function is key in getting the right decision for individual applicants and in holding local authorities to account. It will provide a national overview of how the fund is working. 
and this feedback will give policymakers an insight into the decisions that are being made and how they relate to policy intent. Another key amendment to the bill was the removal of Section 3, which related to outsourcing. This was originally included to allow for contracting with external um, partners, for local authorities to contract with external parties uh, to provide the services on behalf of them at some future time. Many of our stakeholders were clear in their views that private sector companies should not be allowed to administer welfare funds and I had never envisaged it would be private sector companies that would do that. However, it was not possible to specify in the face of the bill that private sector firms could not bid for these contracts and the bill was therefore amended to remove this section. We also took on board the views of the Dele Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee by establishing a right of review of a decision by a local authority on the face of the bill. We acknowledge that as the bulk of the detail on how welfare funds will operate will be set out in regulations and guidance, that regulations under the bill should be subject to affirmative procedure. And we come back to the families under exceptional pressure. And of course, there have been discussions around many amendments that were proposed. And again, we had that, the debate on that earlier. And I know that many stakeholders and MSPs in the chamber wanted to add families under exceptional pressure as an explicit group in the face of the bill. The competence issues surrounding amendments relating to families under exceptional pressure has been well rehearsed, and I don't want to go over it again, but I do want to restate that families under exceptional pressure will continue to be able to access welfare funds in the same way. I'll take an intervention. Michael McMahon. I thank the Minister for trying to clarify this, this situation, but in doing so, she's actually making the, the situation more bizarre. If it is the case that currently under the Scottish Welfare Fund, families under exceptional pressure can access that fund, if an amendment was to create a difficulty for the, the passage of this bill, then all that would happen is that the bill would continue, that the, the, the welfare fund would continue to operate as it does, and families under exceptional pressure would continue to access that fund. So why were you so resistant to having this in the bill? I think there are several things that the Scottish Parliament has always put forward competent legislation and we want to continue to do that and we will continue to do that um, and, and I think that is important for the Scottish Parliament but I also think uh, the interim arrangements that we have just now with COSLA is an interim arrangement we have with COSLA um, operating in, in a sort of discretionary basis that they, and to we have no arrangement that that would continue further and we are already aware that some councils are now coming out of COSLA. We want to make sure that we get this in a statutory footing. It's important we get it in a statutory footing. It's important we get the legal right of review into that process as well and that's what we're currently doing uh, with the Ombudsman and that doesn't exist under the interim scheme and that's why it's important to get this in a statutory footing. We get the legislation right and we make it very clear in our attention at the out Set that families under exceptional pressure are not excluded from accessing the permanent arrangements. And we've been clear on that from the start. And we're in discussion with some of the third sector groups on that just now. And they understand the issue involved. And their concern is that we make sure that families under exceptional pressure are not excluded from accessing funds. And all of the information we have is they are not currently excluded and they will not be, currently, they will not be excluded in the statutory fund. And it, uh, as I said in my earlier, um, on the, the exceptional um, pressure, families under exceptional pressure, the statistics show that 38% of households receiving community care grants complain, contain children in ca comparison to 32% uh, under the, the social fund. And also in terms of um, crisis grants, 30% compared to 16% uh, under the social fund. Another area which has been subject of much debate is the provision of goods versus grants for community care grants and how that links to choice for individuals. And first, I would restate that the guidance on the Scottish Welfare Fund states that local authorities must make sure that the item awarded meets the need of the applicant. For example, where people need adapted or specialist items because of a particular condition or medical need or their family makeup, that item should be 
provided. It is not a question of choice. That is need and that need should be met. However, the Scottish Welfare Fund is a budget limited fund operating in a time of increasing need and for, the reason, for that reason it needs to be able to help as many people as it can in the most efficient way possible and local authorities have found this means awarding goods rather than cash grants, particularly um, for community care grants. And I don't accept that providing choice would not lead to additional costs and local authorities have given us uh, information on that as well. It could be it's higher administrative costs for the local authority. But I have said, and I will reiterate it again, that in terms of crisis grants for short term to meet immediate needs, uh, we will be looking at the default position for that to be cash payment or cash equivalent payments. Many applicants also tell us how much they appreciate the service provided by local authorities with the delivery and installation of the goods, which does relieve a lot of stress. And often they can have that all organized and arranged prior to moving into a house, for example. I'll take an intervention. Just on, ad, just on administration costs for local authorities, in evidence, um, for example, East Dumbartonshire re received £43,970 in administration costs. The total cost of running the Scottish Welfare Fund in the area last year was £224,232. This funding gap had to be made up by the local authority. So there is a real issue for uh, the funding mm -hmm. of this welfare fund and how it's administrated uh, by local authorities, which puts pressure on them to make sure that they are looking for, well, it's not always best value. They're just looking for uh, the cheapest option. Thank you. Minister, you're completely out of time now. If you come to a close, off, I think Margaret uh, McDougall's answered my point. Her amendment earlier and Ken McIntosh's earlier, we're going to put even more pressure on local authorities. They're telling us that, not them. Local authorities are telling that in evidence. So they're looking at getting as, helping as many people as they can in their area in the most cost-efficient way as possible. And for community care grants, that's very often by providing goods and not cash. And I certainly would rather that local authorities could help as many people as possible. Delivery of the current close, system, if I to wind up, presiding officer? Right. Okay, I, I will wind up, but delivery of the current system is generally viewed in a positive fashion, and most people have told us and the committee that local authorities are the right people to deliver the fund, and they welcome the independent review that we were delivered. Presiding officer, the approach to this bill has on the whole been very consensual and I look forward to working with members of parties across the chamber to ensure that regulations and guidance under the bill help deliver the best possible outcomes for welfare fund customers. I move the Welfare Fund Scotland bill. Many thanks. I now call on Michael McMahon. Up to seven minutes, please. Less would be more today as we're very, very tight for yeah. time. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. On behalf of the Scottish Labour Party, I would very much like to welcome what I'm sure will be the passing into law this afternoon of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. At the outset of my contribution, I'd like to thank the clerks of the Welfare Reform Committee who helped to get the bill to this point so efficiently. I'm also grateful to the witnesses who informed the deliberations on the bill as it progressed through Parliament. Having heard all of the evidence, I'm absolutely in no doubt that placing the interim Scottish Welfare Fund on a statutory basis has been the right thing to do. The message which this, which this Parliament has heard is that the interim fund has benefited many vulnerable people across Scotland. The Scottish Welfare Fund has had its problems. It's by no means perfect, but as the Minister said, it has evidently been a comparative success. So let's first of all focus on the positives. Local authorities told us that creating a statutory duty will enhance the ability to retain staff members who bring expertise and knowledge to the practical implementation of the fund. Strange as it may seem, what is no longer in the Bill is also a positive outcome, as the Bill no longer allows for outsourcing. However, the potential benefits that can be derived from joint working between local authorities, such as economies of scale, increased purchasing power, sharing best practice and increased in consistency, will remain in place, and that can only be welcome. Another constructive aspect of the Bill concerns placing the review of decisions in the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman and to have that body take on the new role as a second tier review body. Views on this role were split between local authorities who thought it would be more consistent with the principle of local self-governance, 
for secondary reviews to remain in local authority control. The third sector, however, believes that the use of the SPSO will make appeals independent, consistent and impartial. And the Scottish Labour Party agrees with the third sector on this, and our agreement with the third sector does not end there. However, this brings us to where our disappointments with the bill still persist. It is completely beyond my comprehension as to why the Government has remained so resistant to the principle of dignity being enshrined in this Bill. While the Bill sets out the circumstances in which a local authority can provide assistance, the failure of the Scottish Government to agree to the amendment which would see the needs of families facing extreme financial pressure added to those circumstances is a bitter disappointment. The Bill clearly addresses needs that are the result of sudden crisis but many families have needs that are an ongoing part of their everyday life. The DWP Social Fund had a category for such families under exceptional pressure. And while I recognise that the government's assurances that this is a group of people which they want, to fund, they want the fund to support, its absence from the face of the bill means that it is a commitment which comes now without a guarantee. That's why Labour agrees with the third sector and has argued that the Scottish Government should have enshrined in law that all those in legitimate need of the fund are able to access it as of right. If it's, if it's the ability of the Scottish Government to put this in guidance, then it's surely not out with the, the ambit of this bill. And if it is in the bill in guidance, it could be on the face of the bill. And we now have a ridiculous situation that a piece of legislation is going to be passed without that principle in the bill, but the powers are going to come to us through the Smith Agreement, and we may have to come back to this bill to put an amendment in which will put in place what is exactly happening under guidance in the bill. How ridiculous a situation has been created here this afternoon. Yeah, OK. Mark McDonald. But surely the member must accept that at the moment, if we do not have the competence, it would be wrong to put it in on the basis that in a few years' time, as a result of transfer of powers under Smith, we will have that competence, lest it risk the legislation. Surely the point is that at the point at which powers are unavailable to this Parliament, that is the right time to re-examine things rather than to do it preemptively when we do not have those powers. No matter how many times Mr Macdonald and his colleagues try to argue that case, it will not make any more sense to say that a bill would be jeopardised by putting in the face of that bill something which it's already going to do in guidance and we will have the power to do at some point in the near future. If that is the case, why won't the Scottish Government do what it boasts of doing at any other time and stand up to the deadly Westminster Government <laughs> and implement something that's going to benefit the people of Scotland? It is just not acceptable that that argument, you can make it as many times as you like, it will not stand any serious scrutiny. Quite frankly, to say that it can be in guidance but not in law itself because of Westminster wording of the Section 30 order is a total cop-out. Equally, there have been compelling arguments made that it is better for an applicant to receive an award in the form of cash than to receive vouchers or goods. While the provision, I need to make some progress. While the provision of goods allows councils to ascertain whether an award is being used as intended and local businesses can benefit from organised procurement and distribution, this ignored the fact that choice is essential to maintain a level of dignity, self-determination and reduce stigma for applicants. Treating applicants with respect, despite their circumstances, is vital, so providing options and meeting individual needs should be central to the Fund's process. Given the increasing impact of welfare reforms, many which are still to be seen, there is a genuine concern over a growing level of demand on the Fund and also worries expressed over variation in spend across Scotland. That is why monitoring unmet need, understanding why that may have arisen and watching out for potential shortfalls in administrative funding, which local authorities have already seen supplementing from their own budgets, it surely merited support for annual reviews to take place in order to ensure that the wider outcomes that this bill is trying to achieve are not jeopardised. But yet again, for reasons best known to themselves, the Scottish Government has turned a deaf ear to that request. Another positive, though, did come late this afternoon. That is the, the processing time for applications. Local authorities would, under the bill, have had 24 hours in which to process a crisis grant, while for the previous DWP fund, that deadline was 24 hours. So I welcome the Minister's decision to listen to those who have said that when the key word in this is crisis, that it's essential 
that that part of the safety net provided to vulnerable people was not to be extended beyond a whole day. You need to bring your remarks to close. Yeah. As I said at the beginning, Scottish Labour very much welcomes the creation of the Scottish Welfare Fund, but we agree with the poverty and disability organisations who believe that the principles of dignity and choice for applicants should have been enshrined in this bill. This is a good bill, President Officer, but it could have been so much better. I now call on Alex Johnson. Mr Johnson, five minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been a, an interesting process and I think uh, a, almost a unique one in that the uh, somewhat surprised devolution of an area of welfare expenditure required the Scottish Government to bring together an interim uh, Scottish Welfare Funds Bill uh, or, uh, in fund uh, and to put that in place uh, a year before this legislation uh, to formalise it has been put in place. So as a consequence, we've been able to go through the suck it and see approach. Uh, we've been able to see what's done well, uh, where there have been problems, and in this legislation, we've been able to make changes in some cases where it has made good sense to do so. The moving away from the concept of loans to grants and community care grants and crisis grants is one which uh, I don't think at the end of the day many people opposed. We did have one uh, local authority representation that argued perhaps it may be appropriate to continue with loans. Uh, perhaps we can do something else with loans in the future. It's right that this scheme should concentrate on grants and I, I see no problem with that. The key areas uh, which came to the fore even during the course of the interim scheme was the need to have a proper appeals procedure incorporated within this. And having uh, had the final bill now uh, passed through Parliament, we can formally put that uh, in place. Some of the key elements that have come to discussion during the, the, the consideration of the bill at committee stage were, for example, the 24 versus 48 hours timescale. Uh, and I'm glad that I think we've come to a conclusion on that matter and the Minister has been able to put our minds at rest. Uh, I think there was one person gave evidence, a, a scheme user gave evidence before the commi committee uh, who clearly believed that their application uh, had been completed in the initial phone call, but yet believed that they were left to wait for the 48 hours until news uh, of their successful application was passed back to them. And, and that, if it happened, was unacceptable. I hope it didn't happen. Uh, I hope it was merely a, an impression that was created in error. But what we've heard from the Minister today is a clear indication that that is not the intent, uh, and it should not, and we hopefully, it hopefully will not happen. One of the things that I think we've taken from the interim scheme is that local authorities are actually very good at doing this kind of thing. Uh, there has been a mix of success rates and of course there was that dangerous situation we were in for a while where we thought the scheme was, interim scheme was going to underspend because it took so long for people to understand what was available and for systems to be put in place uh, to pass that money out. There was, of course, additional money added by the Scottish Government uh, during the course of the year, which resulted in more money being available. But at the end of that process, uh, I think we had a scheme that had largely run to budget, had supplied uh, support for those who needed it, uh, and gave us examples of good practice in many local authorities across Scotland. I hope that that is a successful model which we can perhaps adopt for the delivery of other support mechanisms which are yet to be devolved to us here in Scotland. One of the areas where I am disappointed is in the outcome of the discussion on outsourcing. I perfectly understand that most people in this Parliament, perhaps not including myself, do have an objection to the involvement of the private sector in the provision of public service. But I do believe that that provision could have given us the opportunity to include skills and knowledge that are held within the third sector uh, to use them in the delivery of this scheme in future. I hope that we have not lost that opportunity completely by virtue of the fact that there are those with an aversion to private sector involvement. One thing that was discussed today at some length is the fact that the government have chosen to go down the road of affirmative procedure for changes in this legislation uh, once it's brought in. They, 
I'm going to go off at a tangent here and say something quite clear. Not too much, because you've got 30 about, seconds about, left. I, I believe that the negative procedure is underrated and underused. And I believe that in, case, in the case of this legislation, that the negative procedure would have allowed change to happen more quickly if the need for change was identified. That and the fact that administration costs have been very high in the interim scheme is something which we should concern ourselves in the long term. Where we deal with, in the grand order of things, this is a relatively small scheme, and I think too much of it will be spent on administration, and we have to drive administration costs down in future when we have more responsibilities. We will support the bill. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. Can I remind members up to four minutes? Uh, we have no time in hand. Kevin Stewart, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, between April 2013, when the fund was established, and June 2014, 100,000 households have been helped by the Scottish Welfare Fund. That is the interim scheme. And in terms of the legislation that is before us today, uh, we heard at committee from Councillor Norman Macdonald of Kinyan and Yellen Shear, legislation will give certainty not just to local authorities but to the, to the clients about what is in place. Uh, and Dave Berry of Dundee City Council said the proposed legislation would give local authorities a, a assurance. In fact, they will now have a duty that, now, that must be done. That can only be good for the continuing development of the Scottish Welfare Fund. So it is absolutely right. Uh, that we lay out the legislative framework um, to allow this uh, bill, this interim scheme, to be in statute. And I have to say that I am a little bit disappointed that we are constrained uh, by the powers that we have, and we've had a debate about that today. But one thing for sure, I want to uh, make certain that this bill receives uh, royal assent so that duty uh, is there and that local authorities must do all that they can to help those in greatest need. I mentioned earlier uh, that what we have is a, th a fund of £38 million uh, which is to mitigate £6 billion worth of welfare cuts. Uh, and while we uh, are seeing uh, good work uh, across the country, it has to be said uh, that what we are facing uh, with this onslaught of austerity and welfare cuts is quite, quite incredible. And obviously, there are families uh, right ac across this country who are suffering because of the policies of the Westminster government. And when it comes to some aspects of uh, welfare reform, we're actually seeing uh, some... Uh, Tory ministers uh, come out and express their ire, uh, with Nick Bowles, Conservative Minister, uh, describing sanctions in The Guardian today as inhuman. Inhuman. Uh, hardly a system uh, which uh, has dignity and respect at its heart. But I'm pleased that in terms of this bill that the government were willing to accept uh, an amendment that I put forward at stage two uh, to ensure that all welfare fund applicants are treated with respect and that their dignity is preserved. I wish, I wish that the Westminster government would take lessons um, in that regard. Now, there are some aspects of the interim scheme, uh, presiding officer, uh, which did not uh, provide uh, for some of the things that we uh, wanted to see, including the appeal system. And I'm glad that the appeal system has been resolved uh, in uh, this You need to start winding up. Um, I'm also pleased that we chose not to go along uh, the uh, road of uh, loans, because I think that would have been detrimental to those folks in greatest need. £38 million pounds to mitigate £6 billion pounds of cuts uh, is not uh, all that is required, but it is all that we can do at present. 
in terms of the future powers I'm of this sorry, Parliament I'm sorry, you gets. need to wind up. I need to move on. Malcolm Tism, followed by Joe McAlpin. I welcome the fact that the DWP transferred funds for community care grants and crisis loans to the Scottish Government in uh, 2013, that the interim scheme set up then has now been uh, set in statute, and also that there has been some progress uh, between the interim scheme and the legislation before us today. In particular, um, I welcome the fact that we are to have second-tier reviews through the Public Service Ombudsman, and I think that will give the public more uh, confidence in the appeals process, although clearly we have to advertise all the time the right of people to appeal. I also welcome some of the changes that have taken place during deliberations on the legislation, most notably the dropping of part three of the bill, which uh, would have involved outsourcing uh, to uh, the private sector. And I, I was also, of course, pleased, um, um, perhaps a little surprised, but pleased certainly to hear the government accept the uh, time limit, uh, the 24-hour uh, time limit on decision-making, which Ken McIntosh uh, proposed today. But in one regard, at least, uh, we've actually gone backwards today from the interim scheme, and it's been the most contentious of all the debates today around the words families experiencing exceptional uh, pressure. And again, Ken McIntosh gave graphic examples of that, whether it was a uh, um, lone parent um, uh, through a relationship breakup or someone fleeing domestic uh, violence. And I still have not heard from the Minister, perhaps we will in the wind out, how it can be out with powers to put something in primary legislation, but not out with powers to put the same words in regulations or secondary legislation. I've never heard uh, of that in all my many years in Parliament, but I'm sure Stuart Stevenson is going to enlighten me. Stuart It's not about virus, it's about who is a gatekeeper. There are no gatekeepers for secondary legislation except the courts. Gatekeepers exist for primary that block it. That's why it matters. That's, That's an interesting on. point, but I, do, I still find it strange. And I, I would be very interesting if Stuart Stevenson, since he likes this kind of thing, could find me a precedent uh, for that happening in the years of the Parliament or even before. No doubt he'll do that for his homework and tell me tomorrow. Now, um, this is the beginning of uh, welfare devolution. I would like to see uh, quite a bit more, and we're certainly going to get some more uh, from the Smith proposal. So I think it's very important that we do have clear principles in this bill that will be at the centre of of the, uh, those aspects of the welfare fate, uh, state that are devolved. That's why I think the, 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 the amendments moved about needs and choices being taken into account were very, very uh, important. And that, of course, was related to the whole issue of cash versus vouchers. And I think the Inclusion Scotland had a very interesting uh, a few words when it said the use of vouchers may impact on the dignity and respect of applicants. I think it was very striking that we had very strong evidence from Inclusion in Scotland, Child Poverty Action Group and many others uh, whom, whom I think uh, normally the government might pay a little bit more heed to. Important point, and obviously I was disappointed that all those amendments uh, that Labour proposed were uh, defeated. And that, of course, also including uh, our proposal for annual reporting, because we have to keep a, a close watch on how all this works. And again, the Child Poverty Action Group referred to ongoing problems of gatekeeping and poor data collection. And uh, another point, um, for example, that's not been mentioned this afternoon, but did strike me as surprising when I realised it was that there was an underspend on the fund last year. So we have to keep a careful watch on this. The Finance Committee on which I set um, 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 looked at the whole issue of administrative COPs and welcomed the benchmarking exercise COSLA was doing on that. Perhaps the Minister could update us on that in the summing Minister, up. You need to draw your I'm just coming course. to a conclusion. I've got 20 seconds. <laughs> And uh, the Finance Committee also asked about you know, the 2000, how the government arrived at the figure of 2,000 second stage reviews when there's only 144 this year. So we have to monitor this uh, very closely, even if there is no, to be no annual review. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. Joe McAlpine, followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the chance to contribute to today's Stage 3 debate on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. As members are aware, I'm a relatively new member of the Welfare Reform Committee, and when I was appointed to the committee, I had a meeting with the clerk who told me that, unlike some other committees of the Parliament, the Welfare Reform Committee was a consensual committee, and the clerks weren't wrong. The consensual nature of the committee is due in no small part to the types of issues that we deal with, and the Scottish Welfare Fund is a good example of that. People accessing the fund are desperate and their individual circumstances must be acknowledged and respected, not politicised. That's not to say that members don't have their disagreements, as we have had today, but I think in general it's fair to say that we're broadly aligned in op opposing Tory welfare reforms and taking action to mitigate their effect in Scotland. 
Members across the Chamber will all have dealt with the cases that highlight the terrible consequences of UK government welfare reform on some of our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, as has been mentioned already, 100,000 households have already been helped by the Scottish Welfare Fund, and it is right that we put it on a statutory basis to ensure that this vital help will continue. What is not right, of course, is the fact that so many of our citizens are in need of the, this help in the first place. Themes that have arisen in the committee as the bill has progressed are concepts of dignity, choice and respect. And I was pleased that at stage two, the minister brought forward amendments to remove the ability to outsource the scheme. And so there is no risk that private companies will be left in charge. Not that this was ever um, uh, likely to happen under this government, but nevertheless, safeguards are welcome. However, these themes were also raised in relation to the ability of local authorities to give support in kind rather than cash, as been discussed today. I sympathise with Ken McIntosh's intentions in amendments 2, 3 and 5, but as has already been pointed out by um, my uh, colleague uh, Kevin Stewart and the Minister, most of this uh, the, the in-kind grant are to help people leaving institutional care and there is choice available and uh, as has also, the point has also been made is that we have a £38 million fund to deal with six, bi six billion of benefit cuts and we simply have to ensure that as many people as possible are helped by that fund. Uh, the £100 million, uh, provided by the Scottish Government in 2015-16 is a drop in the ocean. Uh, there will be huge pressures on the fund and we must acknowledge the opportunities outlined by COSLA in their briefing for bulk buying goods. I don't believe that the bill is the correct place to address these issues. I also have sympathy for Amendment 7 put forward by Margaret McDougall, which would require consideration of the particular needs and choices of applicants. However, again, we must be careful when working in the context of extreme budgetary pressures not to increase the administrative burden on local authorities. It is important to remember that the people who will access the fund can be facing absolute destitution. The pot that we have to help them is limited, and so if we do not use it cost-effectively, other people facing that absolute destitution will be deprived of help. At stage two, my colleague Kevin Stewart amended the bill to require local authorities to take reasonable steps to ensure that all welfare fund applicants are treated with respect and their dignity preserved, which, uh, which I believe... Um, went a long way to address Margot, Margaret McDougall's concerns. Uh, finally, I do hope that members your across the pause. chamber will be able to support the bill today, albeit with a heavy heart. As other members have outlined and I've said before, in such a wealthy society as ours, we should not have to pass such legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, followed by Tavish Scott. Presiding officer, where, when welfare reform at UK level seems to be incoherent and downright scary for most, if not all, vulnerable people, it is welcome that the Scottish Government and the Welfare Reform Committee have taken time to consult and be guided by the many excellent third sector organisations across this land who understand and support the victims of welfare reform. And I don't use the word victim lightly. The welfare reforms that I see seem to be much more about reform and much less about the actual welfare of our citizens. Presiding officer, the amended bill before us today at stage three proposes placing a duty on local authorities to deliver the fund in line with regulations and guidance that may be issued by the Scottish ministers. As we know, local authorities have been delivering this fund on an interim basis. The fund is intended to provide a safety net for vulnerable people in an emergency when there is an immediate threat to health and safety through the provision of crisis grants. As a Child Poverty Action Group says, and I can thank them, can I thank them, sorry, for the advice and information that they have provided to us during the scrutiny and the process of this bill. They said the development of Welfare Funds Bill, the additional Scottish Government investment and National Scottish Welfare Funds scheme following the abolition of DWP crisis loans and community care grants has provided a level of support to households in Scotland now sadly lacking in many other parts of the United Kingdom. Currently, the fund provides a vital means of support for vulnerable, low-income households who are in or at risk of crisis, facing exceptional pressures and whose ability to live independently is threatened. It plays an important and preventative role, providing a safety net to reduce pressure on costly public services such as residential care, homelessness services and the NHS. 
It will also enable people to live independently or to continue to live independently, preventing the need for institutional care through the provision of community care grants. Presiding officer, when I was a training officer for social work services, I delivered a course which was named Promoting Independence. This was not about Scotland's constitutional future, but about the value placed on personal independence for people with additional support needs or disabilities. So can I draw the Minister's attention to the concerns raised by all of the organisations who gave evidence to this bill? Concerns I know that she will be well aware of, and just to reinforce the need for clear, unambiguous guidance on the needs of people who fall into the categories of families under pressure. I know the Minister holds dear the fundamentals of proper wraparound care for families, and I welcome her reassurances on this particular matter. In her excellent and forthright briefing, as usual, uh, Lynn Williams, on behalf of SCVO, says, We must not underestimate the importance of this legislation. The fund is small, but its reach is significant. It is the final safety net for many people. Scotland can take its first steps in creating a more compassionate social security system with a fair, inclusive and empowering safety net, established as a result of this bill. Or we continue to stigmatise those in poverty. As parliamentarians, we ask you to take the lead in this journey and support amendments to this important piece of legislation. So, colleagues, Minister, we have set a high standard. We have been set a high standard, indeed, and I think it is one that this Parliament across all of the parties can live up to. And if we don't, we have the superb advocates in the likes of Lynn Williams, the Child Poverty Action Group, Inclusion Scotland, and many, many others in reminding us just why welfare state should be just that, a place of safety for our people in need. And I commend the bill and I commend the work of all of those involved in bringing it to this stage today. Thank you. Travis Scott, followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, very much strongly support the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, recognise the role the Minister has played in introducing this statutory measure into Parliament today to put in place in statute uh, measures which have, have been of an interim nature. I also want to recognise the uh, Parliamentary Committee who have done um, important work in scrutinising this and also listening carefully to those who have been so directly affected by uh, so much of welfare reform that is without doubt painful and extremely difficult for many, many, many people who are directly affected by it. But I also want to recognise the submissions that have been made in advance of Stage 3's proceedings here in Parliament today and also reflect, as one or two others might um, uh, who are not here today, but who have been involved in the Smith Commission as well, that some of the most compelling evidence given in uh, recognition of the changes that Scotland can and should be able to introduce into, into, in the future uh, are in the whole area uh, of the safety net that we provide for, for our citizens who are less fortunate than others. Uh, there is no question that there, should, there will be further progress in this whole uh, broad area of policy. Uh, I hope the Devolution uh, More Powers Committee under Bruce Crawford's care careful chairmanship can reach um, a sensible and cross-party uh, accommodation of what, without doubt, a difficult uh, issue and a difficult policy issue. Uh, but in my view, there will be absolutely no doubt uh, that that progress will be made. I also want to recognise the point I think that Malcolm Chisholm firstly made about the review mechanism that the government are introducing through this bill in terms of the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. Uh, that body uh, that many of us interact with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, on behalf of constituents doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a completely blemish free uh, record uh, for every person who doesn't uh, uh, make their complaint stick with the SPSO, uh, then uh, they are less than enamoured. But nevertheless, I very much welcome the government's intent here to introduce that um, PO mechanism to make sure there is a second tier reviewer. Not that I'm sure that will be universally felt by uh, those who've made the initial decision, but that's the nature of uh, this game. And I do want to recognise in that context that there are difficult decisions made by local, of local authority officers over many existing areas of devolved policy, whether it be housing allocations uh, or uh, other issues which directly affect people's lives. This adds, uh, and already has added, another tier of responsibility uh, to those officers. And with the um, Smith Agreement and with what will happen thereafter, more will be added to that uh, workload. And I do think we need to, uh, to uh, recognise uh, that in how we support local government. Um, two or three points just on the amendments that were carefully considered by Parliament, uh, the, well, carefully considered by Parliament this afternoon, is a moot point when we come to stage threes because the time for backbenchers, never mind the minister, is, is so limited. I think we uh, could reflect on that many, many times as to whether we ever have got that right in the uh, 15 years we've been in this place. But I just wanted to reflect uh, two of those points, presiding officer. The first was on the 
debate about uh, in-kind uh, or goods versus uh, cash in terms of how local authorities uh, should uh, approach that, or, should, or rather how government should frame that for local authorities to make that decision. So it seems to me that uh, the state shouldn't assume that it knows best in these occasions, uh, and it just seemed a bit, uh, it just seemed listening to that debate, there was a very top-down approach being taken, whereas we should surely do this from the bottom and up, and I, I do think that was reflected in some of the submissions that we all read uh, prior to this debate. And the final point, presiding officer, uh, is on the, uh, the annual uh, report, which the Minister uh, does not doesn't agree with. I understand uh, that. I was a Minister too, and I always had civil servants telling me we could not do something. Actually, it's a really good point about parliamentary scrutiny. It is a really good point when you are introducing something new to find a different way uh, to do it. And we are, we are introducing something new here, and I think Parliament should adapt and change over time, not just do it the way it has always done it. Our committee structure is not perfect, and, and what I am absolutely sure about is Audit Scotland will pour all over this, and I think we should be ahead of the game rather than waiting for it to happen afterwards. Thank you. I now call Sandra White, followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I can I thank the Welfare Reform Committee, although I'm not a member, and the Minister uh, for the work they have carried out in the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, £38 million, yes, uh, we do welcome this, and I know the Scottish Government will use it to, in the best interest of the Scottish people. But we think we do really need to highlight the fact that 85% of welfare powers are still in the control of Westminster. And I do know that Michael McMahon, who's just passed there, eh, agreed with the third sector in his contribution. Well, I do ask the parties opposite. It was a pity that they didn't support the, the many, many voluntary organisations, 65 organisations, including Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisation, SCVO, Children's First and Gender, Bernardo's, and the Poverty Alliance, who called for the devolution of welfare powers and has been mentioned previously by other speakers. We're looking at £6 billion of cuts to welfare. £38 million, yeah, it's something, but what a missed opportunity to be able to say to our people in a, a rich country like Scotland that they don't have to scrabble about looking for extra monies when they're absolutely in a situation where they're in dire straits in that respect. Now, let's look at the benefits that's actually still uh, reserved. Universal credit, employment support, income support, housing benefit, child tax credit, job seekers allowance, state pension, pension credit, incapacity benefit, child benefit, in work credit, maternity and paternity pay. All reserved to Westminster, we had the opportunity to make sure that was brought to the Scottish Parliament. But as I said, I congratulate everyone for the work that they have done in the Reform uh, Committee. And we have the £38 million at the moment and we will use it in the best interest of the Scottish people. I wanted to touch on a couple of issues, and I think Tavi Scott touched on them also. Uh, basically, I did try to intervene, I think, twice in Mr McIntosh, but wasn't successful, so I want to pick up on some of the points just now. Uh, Ken McIntosh and, and the others, I think Margaret McDougall as well, with a later amendment, was asking about how you know, it was going to be operated in the grants, whether it be cash or etc. But I do think your colleague, Michael McMahon, answer the question for you. You see mentioned the fact that under local authorities they could work together and they could actually purchase under economies of scale. Now I've seen that in my own constituents, I'm sure others have, where people are able to get the goods fairly straight away, it, it creates employment, it recycles and people can go and pick that up and they give over the grant that the local authority gives them and they can bring forward the goods that they desperately need. I'm sorry Ken, I don't have much time but I would have liked to you come in but I think your colleague did answer that question. Economy of scale and the local authority can work together. On the other issue in regarding competency, which I did uh, try to, to, inter, to interject, I think most people here know that I've been trying to push forward the bill of the responsible parking bill. Now, I've been told on many, many occasions by the clerks in this parliament, by the legal team in this parliament, that even if it went through this parliament, it could still be deemed not competent and someone could still take it to court and challenge that and we have to remember that it's not stopping me obviously I'm still pushing forward but it actually has made it more and more difficult to try and push this piece which I think should be welcome legislation through this parliament but the constraints that I and others have been put under by the advice we've had in the parliament that it could still be competent, but it stood, could still be challenged. And I just put that forward to the members here. That it's not just this amendment or just this particular piece of legislation. It's happened previously before. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call Margaret McDougall, followed by Mark MacDonald. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the newest member of the Welfare Committee, it's been a very interesting time to join as this bill was making passage through uh, the Parliament. And this is a significant piece of welfare legislation, and it's crucial that we get it right to protect vulnerable people. Therefore, I'm disappointed that the Scottish Government has decided not to support the Labour amendments today because they promoted choice, openness and transparency and provided support to families under exceptional pressure. The argument that my amendment on choice would put additional pressure on local authority budgets is frankly nothing more than a smokescreen. The amendment is effectively cost neutral and would allow a local authority to pay in either cash or kind based on what the claimant would prefer and what would best suit the needs of that individual after discussion with that local authority. This goes hand in hand with Kevin Stewart's amendment accepted at stage two, as choice is crucial to dignity and respect. My amendment was supported by Poverty Alliance, who argued that the refusal to trust applicants with monetary grants increases stigma and can make that individual at a very low point in their life feel like they are receiving handouts rather than accessing legitimate support from the state social security system. It was also supported by SCVO, who state that the fund should be driven forward by choice and set a benchmark for any future legislation. Today, the Scottish Government had a choice and they chose to ignore the calls of Scottish Labour, the Poverty Alliance and the SCVO. It's also worrying that this government has voted to block openness and transparency today by refusing to support annual reporting. And I think uh, Trevor, uh, sorry, the Liber Lib Dem member made a good point there on uh, this is a new legislation and we should be in fact looking at new ways of how we review and scrutinise that and an annual report in my view is the way we should be doing it. This amendment was supported by SCVO who have called on the Scottish Government to ensure that the fund will be comprehensively reviewed and scrutinised by the Parliament as set out under the provisions of the Welfare Reform for the Provisions Scotland Act 2012. While I do understand this information will be collected and collated elsewhere, I was asking that the Scottish Government bring it in a specific annual report to Parliament to be reviewed and scrutinised. This would have given the Scottish Parliament a formal role to play in the process because we have already heard, for example, that there was a huge underspend last year. It's crucial that we set a clear benchmark for future legislation in this field and this was the opportunity to do it given it is a new and untested system and one of our first pieces of welfare legislation. I find it unbelievable that even though it was proposed in the Welfare Reform Act 2012, it has been blocked today. To conclude, presiding officer, I'm disappointed that the Scottish Government has today decided to vote against Scottish Labour's amendments, except for Ken McIntyre's one on processing time, and all of the amendments which are widely supported by the third sector. Today, this Government have voted against the principle of choice, openness and transparency and supporting families under exceptional pressure. This was a bill to set the future standard of welfare legislation in Scotland and was witnessed today, and we've witnessed today the Scottish Government's rhetoric doesn't match reality. I now call Mark Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And there we have it in a nutshell, the problem with the Scottish Labour Party, that they assume that because we did not agree with their amendment to put something on the face of the bill, that ergo we must be opposed to supporting families. That's the kind of punch and duty, black and white approach on issues of welfare that does the Labour Party no credit whatsoever. Now, I have no hesitation, Presiding Officer, in supporting this bill, although, as Joan McAlpine quite rightly points out, it is not something we should feel the need to be introducing in a wealthy society but that need is nonetheless there. And why is that need there? Because, as has been pointed out, we have a situation where there are around £6 billion of welfare cuts that are going to affect the most vulnerable people in our society. The bill, as it stands, allows for a £38 million fund because that is the limit to which we can extend within the powers and the resources that we have. But we have a situation at the moment where what we are doing is installing a safety net below a safety net because it ought to be the case that the welfare system 
as administered at a UK level, should be the safety net which catches people. But what we are seeing at the moment is a system at Westminster which is widening the holes of that safety net, which will mean more and more people fall through it. So we then have to install our own safety net below that. And while it is a small safety net in comparison to the cuts that are affecting people, it is a safety net that is required and that will deliver real tangible impact on some of the most vulnerable individuals in our society. I want to focus the majority of my remarks, though, presiding officer, on part of the debate which has ensued today. Um, and it's around the, uh, the argument that has existed over the amendment that the Labour Party put forward, which could have seen the potential for the bill not being awarded royal assent. Now, firstly, the reason why the reason why legislation, uh, there's a difference between legislation and guidance, is that guidance to legislation does not require royal assent. That is why the matter can be put into guidance. But secondly, Michael McMahon made the uh, argument uh, in his uh, speech that what we ought to have done today was to put forward the amendment and then have a fight with the Westminster Government over this. He said it himself. He said that the Scottish Government should just fight with the UK Government because that's apparently what we are all about, is just fighting with the UK Government. Well, I'll give him the opportunity to clarify the remark that he made, but I'm sure Thank the official McMahon. report will show it in accuracy. It is not the, the uh, Parliament's authorities that have said that this uh, amendment couldn't go through, but only advice from the Minister. No one else has said that we would have the difficulty that he is, is trying to get this Parliament to accept. You have less than a minute, Ms Macdonald. And, and, as, and as the member will note, the advice that came back quite clearly was that the issue is not around admissibility, is not around competence, but around admissibility. And there is a very big difference between those two things. And at the end of the day, it is in the gift of the Advocate General rather than in the gift of the Parliament's lawyers. And the point here is... The point here is that uh, the second element of that argument appears to be powers will come to this Parliament eventually as part of the Smith Commission process. So let's act before those powers are there, which is exactly the, the, the issue that, that has led us to not be able to agree to that amendment. And it is a risky strategy. But the reason it's a risky strategy is that the risk is not carried. The risk is not one that is carried by the Scottish Government. The risk is carried by those vulnerable individuals who would therefore find themselves unable to access the fund were the legislative competence to be challenged. That is why it could not be accepted. I would have hoped the Labour Party would have at least been able to understand that. I know you know we have to wind up speeches and I'll go to four minutes. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I think this debate has been genuinely interesting. Obviously, there have been moments of um, um, some exchange and some passion. Um, but I think it does represent the conclusion of an important and interesting process for a number of reasons. Obviously, this uh, bill scrutiny, uh, embarked upon with the Welfare Reform Committee, followed the operation of an interim scheme, which was the implement of devolution of the social fund. And I think that background was actually very important, uh, both to local authorities and to the Scottish Government, in informing them about what works and what doesn't work work. And I think that that practical information was able then to inform both the bill and the scrutiny process. And I hope this legislative process will provide a template for how this Parliament approaches a new and important welfare powers being delivered in the back of the Smith Agreement. And the bill does something else. It rightly recognises the relevance and the importance of using local authorities with their geographical spread as being suitable for the delivery of a key welfare uh, provision. And it also recognises that the local authorities themselves have gleaned uh, experience and built up expertise. I think that builds a very solid base for the current system, and I think it holds out well uh, for the future. I can see further opportunities for local authorities when the new powers are introduced. Now, presiding officer, it is clear that the bill with the amendments which were passed today provides a vital local link to people in sudden and perhaps unpredicted need with the swift provision of help to meet that need. And there is also a welcome recognition of the importance of conferring upon local authorities flexibility in how to meet that need. What I think we're all agreed upon is that when extreme difficulty is encountered, help should be to hand which is quick and appropriate. And I think the bill achieves that objective. 
However, I was uh, presenting officer less than impressed by the Scottish Government's opposition to Mr McIntosh's amendment, his amendment number four, which uh, would have enabled qualifying individuals to include being part of a family facing exceptional uh, pressure. I think Mr McIntosh argued his point well. He identified, I think, a need to clarify the definition of qualifying individuals. And the Scottish Government said that the amendment would place the bill beyond the scope of the Section 30 order and the whole bill would then become ultra vires. Now, that may be an opinion, but the Minister failed to clarify what legal advice had been sought and from whom or what it said. She failed during the passage of the bill to clarify if she had consulted with the UK Government on their attitude to such a to such a provision. So, in short, the Scottish Government's response to me was unsatisfactory and unconvincing. But interestingly, Section 2 is unamended, and, and this may offer succour unexpectedly to both Mr McIntosh and the, the Minister. It seems to refer to individuals in subsection 1, line 2. So, presumably, a family presiding officer, which comprises individuals, could all present themselves as individuals and be addressed under the section. So, how the clarifying amendment creates an ultra-virus status I think is bizarre. <laughs> Equally important is to understand that when people find themselves in such distressing situations, they may find it difficult to think clearly or indeed to describe what their circumstances are. And I think by providing for both a local authority review of decisions and referral to the Ombudsman um, is an important safeguard. And I think it also provides reassurance to the claimant. And I think that's a very important aspect of this legislation. But you know, presiding officer, if claimants are entitled to reassurance, and they are, so is this parliament, and so is the taxpayer, entitled to be reassured that the system is working effectively and transparently. And my party supported Mrs McDougall's, McDougall's amendment to provide for reports to be laid before the parliament by the Scottish Government. Now, that seemed an entirely reasonable requirement. The Scottish I'm sorry, you need to end. The Scottish Government's response, in short, explained why all the information was there, and the question remaining is, well, why not put it into a report? So, in conclusion, presiding officer, I think this is a good bill. It's an important one. It's welcome. It will make a difference, and my party supports it. Thank you. I now call Ken McIntosh. Ms McIntosh, six minutes. Thank you, President Officer. We will shortly vote on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, and I hope and expect the Chamber uh, to be unanimous in our support for this measure. I want to thank all of those uh, whose contributions have brought us to the stage, the Minister and her team, members of the Welfare Reform Committee, uh, the third sector and anti-poverty organisations who offered their expertise. And I want to, as Ms McKelvey did, I want to particularly thank Lynn Williams from SCVU and also Hannah McCullough from CPAG for their uh, support advice and for their forbearance. But perhaps most important of all, I want to thank the many individuals with direct experience of welfare in Scotland who shared their personal life stories and their insights on being on the receiving end of the Scottish Welfare Fund. This is not a particularly earth-shattering piece of legislation, but it's an important one nonetheless. And I, I don't also want to shatter Mr Macdonald's belief that this somehow was invented all by SNP ministers. It was actually the Conservatives and Liberals who decided to devolve the former DWP-administered social fund to local authorities in England and to pass to us the power to decide on how to provide this support in Scotland. Ministers have, for the most part, done the right thing topping up the fund itself, as well as the welcome change, moving from a system of loans to one of grants. And there have also been a number of practical reforms, replacing the DWP administration with the service provided by our local authorities and establishing an independent appeals mechanism. I think it's fair to say the appointment of the Ombudsman to conduct this task was not greeted with unanimous approval. It was a point made by Mr McMahon earlier. But I also believe there is some optimism that this will prove effective. And I would also thank the Minister for responding to at least some of the stronger concerns raised about the Bill. The Scottish Government's original proposal to allow the administration of community care grants and crisis payments to be outsourced or privatised struck most observers as particularly ill-founded. And I want to thank the Minister for recognising the danger in such, inherent in such an approach, the unacceptability of profiting from social misfortune, even if, much to our amusement, her SNP colleagues on the committee seemed more dogmatically and unquestionably loyal to the Government's original will than to the evidence before them. Now, there was not a huge amount of movement from the Minister at Stage 2, but I want to thank her for at least acknowledging some of the arguments uh, and, for example, in tempering the powers of the Ombudsman to pursue claimants. And can I also add my thanks to her uh, for her acceptance at stage three of the amendment in my name on the moving to a 24-hour deadline. 
However, I also want to express my disappointment, my misgivings perhaps, over our approach to this legislation. This is one of the first bills to lay the foundations of welfare in Scotland, and we're about to get many more such welfare powers. A point Malcolm McChisholm talked about the significance uh, of uh, devolving uh, more welfare powers to Scotland. Yes, there has been a nod in the right direction, but it's critical we get the principles right from the start, and I'm not convinced that we have, even though the words dignity and respect are now in the face of the bill. When it, come, when it came to what that means in practice, when it came to offering welfare claimants some sort of say or some sort of choice, some control over their own treatment, the minister balked at the prospect. Now, I'm not going to rehearse the whole argument. We had several uh, contributions, additional contributions from Michael McMahon, from Sandra White, Joan McAlpine, uh, and a uh, very uh, interesting one from Annabel Goldie in summing up there. But I believe that it demonstrates the two sides uh, to this administration. Now, I have no doubt that the Minister wants to talk the language of progressivism. I have no doubt that she sees herself and many in her, her party colleagues broadly as social democrats. But I worry that many of the actions of this government are conservative with a small c. SNP ministers often seem more concerned not to rock the boat, not to upset people, than to make the radical change needed with the powers already at their disposal. Uh, certainly, colleagues, the minister and colleagues like uh, Mr Stewart seem never happier than when turning an issue in which we can make a practical difference into a constitutional impasse, featuring, by and large, the big bad bogeyman, bogeyman Westminster. In this particular case, my fear is that by essentially replicating the old social fund, we are doomed to replicating some of the faults of the welfare system. We know that the current system and the welfare reforms introduced by the Tories even more so are overly judgmental. Inadvertently or otherwise, the current system uh, can demean rather than empower. And I'm not convinced we've done enough to put the needs of individuals at the heart of our thinking. I recognise these are difficult decisions at a difficult time. When our welfare system is under attack, as it is from the current Conservative government, then in some ways our first duty is just to hold on, to defend what we've got, to stop the vulnerable being further undermined and subject to political interference. But by not fully grasping the importance of these principles, by not adopting a more rights-based approach, if we don't look at the fact that whatever the original intent of welfare to tackle the big evils of want, squalor and poverty, in some ways it's actually become a sop to the fact that we now live with almost permanently long-term mass unemployment, we're almost accepting our willingness to live permanently with poverty in our midst. And I do not believe that's something we're prepared to do, that that is the point of welfare. It should be there to get people back on their feet. It should be there as a support. It should not be judgmental. It should not stigmatise. And yet I think we're in danger of doing exactly that. This is just the first in several new measures, and I hope the Scottish Government will reconsider its approach as we develop welfare powers in Scotland, and that we all think again about what we're trying to achieve in the long term. How do we treat the vulnerable in our society? What status do we give them, and how can we best help them? And on that note, I do believe that we should support this bill for the benefit it will bring to the people of Scotland. Thank you, Mr McIntosh. I now call on Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate, Minister, until five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to the members for their contributions to this afternoon's debate, and I have encouraged that across the Parliament there has been recognition of the benefits of the statutory Scottish welfare funds. There have been disagreements about some of the detail of what should be in the Bill and what might be more appropriate for regulations. However, the support across the Chamber for the principles of the Bill is strong. And this Bill is also supported uh, by the third sector and the third sector organisations who have worked with us uh, as we have worked the Bill up and also who will work with us as we produce the regulations and the guidance. I want to make a couple of comments that have been made, um, and I don't want to just rehash constantly the families under exceptional pressure, but I do want to make it absolutely clear that families under ex exceptional pressure will be able to access the statutory Scottish uh, Welfare Fund Scotland it's absolutely critical. They can access it just now and they're able to access it in the future. Now, there have been arguments we should have just gone for it and risked it and whether the legislation is competent or not. And, you know, somewhere in me wanted to just say, Aye, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's take them on and let's just try and challenge this legislation. But the result of this is far, far too serious. This is about vulnerable people. If we don't get this legislation, get royal assent, we won't have a statutory 
the Scottish Welfare Fund. We won't have the 24-hour processing time that we've agreed today is the best way forward. We won't have, uh, because that's part of the statutory fund, and I'm not willing to take that risk that if we don't get that, we won't, have, um, we won't be able to do any of those things that we want to do. We want to help vulnerable people, and we've, I've given a commitment that families under exceptional pressure will not be excluded from the statutory welfare fund. Can the Minister tell us, if, this legislation, uh, if the, the Scottish Welfare Fund requires legislation to allow it to operate, how in, uh, is it possible that the bill has operated for the past two years providing the support that it would continue to do. Yeah, yeah. Putting it into statute, yes, gives some protections, but it does not change the, the, the rules, the criteria for uh, applications, which have operated for two years. No, I think what we have just now is a discretionary fund, an interim fund, uh, and it's discretionary. It is not a statutory fund based on... And the, 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 Criteria for the Scottish Welfare Fund are laid out in terms of what was in the Section 30 order, and that's why it, the, the bill has followed the section, section 30 order, which gives the Scottish pa Government or Parliament powers to, over aspects of welfare. Now, the issue here is that what I would like is to have all the powers over welfare, and we wouldn't be in this position today. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, what I would say is I've not just given the commitment that we will. Uh, put it in regulation and guidance. I've also given a commitment when we do get the powers from the Smith Commission that we will look at widening the scope of the bill to just any last vestige of doubt that we are not caring for families under exceptional pressure. And I don't, I don't appreciate the message that Labour members are putting out today that in some way this government does not care about families under exceptional pressure. This government has made sure that the current fund and the fund, the statutory fund, will uh, look after people in those Stop circumstances. Man, Secondly, uh, the point that Margaret McDougall made at the end there about uh, the choice. We are very clear, and I outlined uh, in the initial debate, some of the choices that do exist for people uh, when they're applying for a community care grant. And I want to make very clear that, that Margaret McDougall didn't seem to distinguish the difference between a community care grant and a crisis grant. And I've been very clear that as we move forward in regulation, crisis grants cash should be the default payment for crisis grants. And that may be cash neutral for, lo neutral for local authorities. But local authorities have told us and told us very clearly and have demonstrated to us just how much more they can get out of the, the welfare fund and how many more people they can assist by providing goods um, in, instead of cash in, for community care grants when we're talking about large sums of money. And also the evidence we have from the people who've, who've benefited from the Scottish Welfare Fund is they very much appreciate that service. They have some choice in it. They can choose what they want, the furniture. They can decide the date it's be to be delivered. That is currently happening. I'll take the go. intervention. That local authorities are underfunded to administer the fund. Minister... I mean, Margaret McDougall seems to be talking here in circles. One minute she's asking us to um, take away the right of local authorities to use, to, have that, to, to be able to fund um, goods, and then at the same time, because they're telling us it, it's cost too much, and then she's saying, but they're underfunded. So, no, we provide £5 million for local authorities to administer the Scottish Welfare Fund. And for me, it's very important when we've got a limited budget that it's helping those that it should be helping and that's the vulnerable people in Scotland. And we do believe that they should be treated with dignity and respect at all times. And that's why I was very willing to help uh, to accept Kev Kevin Stewart's amendment to that effect. And the third sector organisations have been telling us that they, they're pleased that we've taken that move forward as well. So I, I would want to, to, to make sure that that's understood by Margaret McDougall because I'm not sure she did understand it. So as we move on... Um, I would certainly say that where there are things that can improve in terms of how the fund operates, and we need to work One with moment, local Minister. authorities. One moment. Can people who are coming to the chamber please do so quietly? It's disrespectful to the Minister um, that she's taking part in this debate throughout, and you've just walked in and you're not listening. Minister. Right. And we need to work with local authorities to ensure that the people who need help are able to get it and when they need it. And we're doing that through a structured programme of improvement work. 
The Welfare Reform Committee made a number of recommend recommendations in their Stage 1 report that touched on the more operational aspects of the interim scheme, and it is right that they highlighted, amongst other things, length of application forms, processing times, which we have dealt with today, and local authority variation. And we're continuing to, to work on that and work with our local authorities to get that right and to have the scheme, the scheme consistent across the country. But another issue that was raised, uh, and I want to touch on in case I run out of time, is the annual report and the transparency. Again, members said we're not being transparent with this scheme. This is one of the most transparent schemes that we've ever... Every quarter, 84 pages of information are provided publicly and they're scrutinised by other members of the chamber, by third sector organisations, by the Welfare Reform Committee. And I think that's the right way to do it because at an early stage, if there's a pattern developing that we, you know, that we want to, that could be improved or changed, we can deal with that at a very early stage. And I, for one, actually appreciate that kind of scrutiny we're getting from the third sector, from the Welfare Reform Committee. And it's a continuous process and I don't see putting that all together once a year is going to make any difference because I think we should be acting when we know there's a problem happening so we can do that on a quarterly basis rather than once a year as is being proposed. So there's no lack of transparency in this scheme. This is transparent and we'll continue to make sure that it remains transparent. We're also working um, with... Jane, the Minister. OK, sorry, I, I didn't realise the time there. I will uh, wind up. But what I would say is that this is a vitally important piece of legislation. It doesn't only provide assistance to some of the most vulnerable, it provides assistance to the most vulnerable people in Scotland. And it's also a stark contrast between the UK government, how they've responded to the abolition of the social fund and the nationwide scheme we're introducing here in Scotland. And I would hope all of this parliament will get behind us in this scheme to make sure we get it absolutely right for those that need it most. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. There is only one question we put as a result of today's business. The question is... That motion number 12485, in the name of Margaret Burgess, on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> that concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.